Coming up next on this week, computer hardware, AMD 7970. It's the new fastest GPU ever. Hard drive prices, are they coming down? Match memory, does it matter? And a triple head comes to NVIDIA. AMD should just drop it to 32 nanometers. Silent PCs, it's the airflow and quite a bit more. All coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 150, recorded December 22nd, 2011. The Brick House tried to kill us. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ford, featuring available voice activated sync. Sync gives you versatile access to music, podcasts, and more from just about any device. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your Mac, PC, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, and welcome to the show where we talk to you about the biggest news in hardware, and then we get down and dirty with your viewer questions. I'm joined, as always, by the man, the myth. Actually, dude's for real. He's coming out of Kentucky. He's Ryan Shroud from PCPer.com. Ryan, how's it going tonight? Doing well. Weather is good. Ready for the holidays. Um, and, yeah, a lot of GPUs sitting around me. It's <laughs> it's that time of year where we, we kind of get remember. these things in big groupings. I don't remember the week before Christmas being the big announcement week for graphics technology. When when did that happen? It's not before supposed this year. to be. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. It's not supposed to be. It's it, they, all, they always seem to come in bunches. Um, but yeah, that was weird. We'll talk about the seventy nine seventy review that AMD okay. launched uh, just yesterday, I guess. But the, the the timing seems a little odd. Three days before Peculiar. Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I can understand graphics companies finally being like, screw it. We don't want to be lost in the middle of 12,000 announcements at, at CES. But yes. doing it three days before Christmas seems like a great way to get your announcement lost for a completely different reason. So we'll talk about yeah. that in a second. We, we, biggest story for you this week, I think the Galaxy G4 CTX 570 MTD MDT X4, which just rolls off uh, my braces wrapped <laughs> teeth. Overclocked graphics card review, and it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, opening graphs are really simple. One of the key selling points of the AMD Radeon series of graphics cards the last few generations has been Ifinity, and mm -hmm. uh, now uh, Galaxy, one of Nvidia's partners, is um, <laughs> coming up with their own sort of variation on Ifinity, which they call MDT or Multi Display Technology. What's it's going very on fancy there, sounding, isn't it? So, so it the idea is, awesomely fancy. is is kind of simple, um, but there there are a couple limitations to it. the The idea is so the the Nvidia GPU only has two display outputs out of it. It has two dual right. link DVI capable connections, um, and that's kind of why you have to have that's why you have to have SLI in order to get three display gaming on an Nvidia setup. Uh, so what Galaxy has done is they've worked with another company called IDT that makes display controllers and this type of thing, and the chip that basically takes in the connection from the NVIDIA GPU and splits it out on its own. And if you look here at the, uh, at the card, you'll see that this, this Galaxy card actually has four uh, DVI connections on it. You can scroll down a little bit so you can see, see the card there. So you can see it's got four DVI connections, three of which are actually one connection out of the GPU. One of them, uh, it doesn't really matter which one, but I think it's this one, can actually do dual link DVI. 2560 by 1630p res or 30 inch screen resolution. The other three will be connected to a single output, and um, they support a resolution as high as 5760 by 1080, Ooh. which is three 1080p monitors in landscape mode. And that's kind of like nice. the default standard uh, Ifinity Nvidia surround resolution as well. Uh, the GPU in here is a GTX 570, as you mentioned. It's slightly overclocked. I think it goes at uh, 800 megahertz as opposed to the 732 megahertz of the reference speed. And it has 1.25 gigs of memory that all of the GTX 570 cards have. Um, so it actually... It 
70 how you would expect it to perform does well in single GPU or single display gaming uh, but if you're buying an MDT card which is the series from Galaxy you're not going to be running on, on a single display because you're paying a little bit of premium for this IDT chip and the ability to to run uh, multi-display technology on an NVIDIA single card solution so if you're only going to run one display definitely buy a different card right save yourself some money or spend right. that money on a card that comes with a higher overclock or something like that Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have actually had a couple of other MDT cards in-house before. I think one was a 560 GTX, uh, yeah, a GTX 560 Ti that actually supported five displays, not just four. The problem we had with that card was that it didn't support the 5760 by 1080 resolution. It supported <laughs> uh, triple 1680 by 1050 displays, which are not nearly as common as 1080p displays now, especially if you're looking at somebody who's... Right looking to buy three monitors for gaming. They're a serious gamer. They're probably not running on 16 by 10 panels. Um, this one does support that resolution. So it changes kind of our perspective and our opinion on the uh, capabilities of the technology and, and the benefits there, thereof. So um, it worked. We, we were able to play quite a few games running at uh, 5760 by 1080, but there is, there's one kind of little hiccup in the technology in that, at that resolution, it only supports 50 hertz. So it, won't, it can't run at 60 hertz. The reason is, is, is a bandwidth limitation, essentially, over that connection from the GPU. There's not enough bandwidth to push 5760 by 1080 at 60 hertz, but they can push it at 50 hertz. And you might say, well, that's Are not most, a big deal. Go ahead. But most monitors won't actually support a 50 hertz resolution, I thought. It's not most, but it's some. And that's the okay. problem, is it's not a really well documented feature or you know mm -hmm. it's not it's not it doesn't say will not support 50 hertz or does support 50 hertz on most monitors so you kind of right. have to do a lot of research to figure that out and <laughs> even in the case like we were testing with uh, three Acer 3D panels actually that do support 50 hertz the mm -hmm. other problem you run into is some games will not recognize the custom resolution that you have set at 50 hertz so uh, like Batman Arkham City would not run at 5760 by 1080. Instead, the highest we could get it to work at is 38720. Uh, Dirt right. 3, though, ran fine. Battlefield 3 ran fine. Uh, Civ 5, you know, Bad Company 2, Deus Ex, Human Revolution. A lot of games worked, but there were some that didn't. All the Valve Source games, for example, do not work in this configuration. Uh, you know, the, the Galaxy guys are telling me you can do some mods, some INI um, modifications and that kind of stuff and get it up and running. Uh, but for most gamers, they're not really going to want to kind of go down that difficult of a route. So, you know, it's, right. kind of a mix, it's kind of a mixed bag. It's a really good card, and it's, they're the only partner to really kind of innovate and try to do something like this to try to keep up with that, that primary, one of those primary features that AMD has been able to offer since the five, four or 5,000 series cards that NVIDIA's GPUs have not. So it's, it's interesting, and, and the premium over a standard 570 is only like 30 bucks fairly fairly mm -hmm. minimal considering you're getting overclocked speeds and this capability <laughs> it's um you know it's, it's definitely worth a look it's the cheapest nvidia solution to do 5760 by 1080 at that performance level right, right? you can get sli cards but you're going to pay more than 340 dollars and you can get uh like the evga gtx 560 ti to win which is a pair of gpus on a single board Right, but that's going to cost you 530. So, if you want to try that and you want to stay in the NVIDIA ecosystem and, and looking for like the lowest cost option that will get you that kind of performance level and that resolution, uh, like this mm -hmm. Galaxy GTX 570X4 card is is probably the best option, probably the only option right now. It, it's it's an interesting card. I don't know if it's going to have a huge following, really, but uh, I don't know. I mean, do you think this is kind of something that can help address the deficiencies of the NVIDIA cards without Ifinity? I think once you get outside of, of uh, you know, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Like once you get outside of, I can't think of the name of, uh, not the, the the open source flight simulator, which is kind of funny because I was flight just looking simulator, at the web page. Right. Oh, oh, yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, you know, once you get outside, once you get outside of like Flight Simulator X and certain kinds of commercial enterprises where they do a lot of multi-monitor stuff, financial, uh, you know, I, I, I think the reason NVIDIA hasn't done their own Infinity clones is just the market's small. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, the triple head gaming market's pretty small. I, you know, I, I, I think it's cool. I think it's great. Somebody's doing this part for NVIDIA, but the 50 Hertz monitor thing just seems like a bad idea. You know, people yeah. will be able to work with it who can, you know, people are going to be spending that much money for monitors. Probably don't want to be sitting around going, like, gosh, you know, uh, should I get the 50 Hertz monitor or the 60 Hertz monitor? Meanwhile, AMD's actually stepped up uh, Tahiti 28 nanometers, the AMD Radeon HD 7970 running a ridiculous three gigabytes of video memory. That's just unhinged. Um, PCI Express 3.0, uh, the first official DirectX 11.1 support, which doesn't even matter until Windows 8, which isn't coming until later this year. 4.31 billion transistors. What's the performance story on the 7970? So 7970 is, without a doubt, the, the fastest graphics, is the fastest GPU on the planet now. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, we put it, put it up against the GTX 580 and the 6970. 580 was uh -huh. the previous top-end GPU. It beats it by, you know, like 15% in some games, 25 to 30% in other games. Kind of depends uh, and, and usually more so, obviously, at the higher resolutions, which a lot of times we talk about 30-inch monitors in terms of the high resolutions. But now that we talk about things like surround and Ifinity, it's actually more important for more users. I think, I think more people are going right. to have three panels than are going to have a 30-inch screen. So, I mean, you, you labeled off the specs. You can I mean, buy three panels for less than a 30-inch screen. I mean, that's for the way less than a 30-inch screen, yeah. yeah. Uh, you, I mean, you lay it off the specs, 4.3 billion transistors. Uh, it's the first 28 nanometer GPU as well. Um, things like the PCI Express 3.0 bus, nice as a feature, not really that important. Uh, the GX 11.1 specification isn't really going to matter until Windows 8 comes out. The only major uh -huh. feature that it adds is it standardizes the um, 3D stereoscopic stuff. So you won't have right. 3D vision versus HD 3D anymore. You'll just have one standard um, that game developers can write to, and it'll just work. Uh, so that's mm -hmm. good. But, I mean, 3 gigs of frame buffer is, is twice as much as the GTX 580, right? I mean, it goes from right. 1.5 to 3 gigs, and the sole purpose of that is Ifinity. That's, I mean, not the sole purpose, but the primary benefit of that is, is benefiting gamers who have ultra-high resolutions, 5760 by 1080, being kind of that right. key one. Because um, this is, unless you have a 4K monitor, this this amount of GPU power is pretty much pointless. Your 24-inch 1080p monitor cannot even begin to challenge this card. This, you, you, this, the, you know what I mean? For the cost of this card, you should buy something two or three steps down and two more monitors. And then in another year, think about upgrading to, a, to right. one of these. I mean, and it, yep. it, what's funny is, is the testing... Um, you look at 1920 by 1080, uh, Battlefield 3, the, the 7970 was what, 13% faster at 1912, or should be 1920 by 1080, 20% faster at 2560 by 1600, which is what you'll be running if, you, if you've got a single, you know, 27-inch or 30-inch or monitor. Um, have you done a lot of triple panel testing yet? We haven't done the triple panel testing, which is uh, one of the reasons why I was complaining about our GPU test bed. PCI Express motherboard issues, um, but right. we, we are going to do that. We want to do triple panel testing on this and kind of see um, what's, what's kind of interesting in that, in that regards and trying to do that performance comparison is you can do three uh -huh. displays on a single AMD card. You can't really do three displays on your standard NVIDIA card. We have to use something like the Galaxy GTX 570 uh, MDTX4 or SLI GTX 560s or 570s or something like that to try to get something close to that. Um, also worth noting on this GPU is it's, it doesn't use any more power than the GTX, or I'm sorry, it doesn't use any more power than the Radeon HD 6970, which is uh -huh. the 40 nanometer, 40 nanometer GPU prior kind of flagship part. So you get about 30 to 40% more performance at the same uh -huh. power level. And that is, you know, thanks to the 28 nanometer process technology, <laughs> moving down to that, uh, that's, it's really impressive. Um, and then the only caveat I guess I'll put in on the performance level is that even though it is, let's say we give it a, a, benef a, a, a difference of 20% to the GTX 580. GTX mm -hmm. 580 came out a year and a month ago. And the 6970 came out almost exactly a year ago. It's been a long time since we've had 
a new flagship GPU longer than I think we've ever gone in the past having, you know, one company or the other kind of come out with a, with a new high-end option. So, it, you know, that's great. It's great news for enthusiasts because it only means good things down the road. The downside is this is a $550 video card. Um, right. That, that I wasn't so excited about. It, you know, mm -hmm. the price is kind of warranted because it, it is more powerful than the $499 GTX 580. The downside right. is when the GTX 580 launched a year and a month ago, it was priced at $499. So we haven't seen, we've seen tons of GPU competition in that 250 and below realm, but almost mm -hmm. nothing in the 300 to, to, to 500 range. And because of that, you see, you know, if there had been competition, NVIDIA's GTX 580 would not still be $499, and this card would not right. have had the benefit to be able to come out at $550 uh, when it is actually available on January 9th. Um, so it's, 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 I mean, it's a great card. If you want the fastest graphics card you can buy, it's like a single <laughs> GPU. This is it, right? Um, and it, that is, it all depends on what the availability fun. will be. I, I got to say, as, mu as much fun as we poke of, of of those periods in time where it's like, hey, the new world's fastest GPU. Oh, boy. Yeah. It's a new week and a new world's fastest GPU. I have never seen you so nonplussed by a performance part ever. Is, is that because you are seriously concerned about whether or not AMD can ship this in volume or because another card at the GTX 580 level has been so desperately needed for so long? I think it's more the secondary part, right? I think it's more mm -hmm. that... I've wanted this card for so long. We wanted something faster <laughs> than a 580 that wasn't right. a dual GPU card that it's kind of like, okay, this is what we wanted. This is what we needed. It wasn't a surprise. I mean, it's still like if I, if I were personally building a system today, I would put, I would put this card in it. Um, like it's not available today, but on January 9th, right? And, and there's a lot of people mm -hmm. like in the comments on our article, they're like, hey, NVIDIA is going to have their next generation GPU out sometime in 2012. And that's the problem is it's sometime in 2012. They haven't been right. any more specific about release dates. And a lot of the rumors are saying late March to early April timeframe for that, which gives AMD quite a big lead, you know, three months to sell their 7900 series. And they're going to have, they're going to have a 7950. They're going to have a 7800 series. They're going to have a 7700 series. Probably all of those will be released before NVIDIA gets their, their Kepler GPU even out on the market. So the AMD is going to have a big lead. Wow. And I think, I think if they can produce them, I think they'll sell a lot of these cards. And that's what we'll have to see on January 9th. If, if they sell out in an hour and <laughs> then we wait two that's, weeks for any more to come in stock, that's a big problem. That's a huge problem. And it's a problem that AMD has had in the past. I'm curious, I mean, do you think 28 nanometer, do you think they have 28 nanometers sorted and they're going to push it down across the lineup as quickly as possible? As you know what, it's AMD. They're, they're probably right. going to have enough trouble getting the premier part running. And by the time they get it settled out, then they'll move it to the other parts. There, there's, um, interesting, <laughs> there's an interesting debate there, right? Why do it, because right. NVIDIA has kind of said, alluded to, they're going to start with the mid range, maybe the low end and go up because your yields can be better at the low end. Uh, AMD mm -hmm. starting at the high end kind of indicates that they are comfortable with their yields from TSMC. Uh, and, and so they, they seem confident in, in stuff that they're going to be able to, to, to bring that all the way down uh, through, through the family relatively smoothly. That's what they say, right? But if they right. release 10,000 parts in two months, that's not enough. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> did, did reviewers get the majority of cards uh, <laughs> available? We'll see. That would be bad. Yes. Solid state drive, hard disk drive price analysis, analysis, boy, English is a difficult language. Uh, end of shortage in sight. That is a bold statement. Um, There's a question mark on it, though. There is a question mark on it. So <laughs> for those of you who have not been listening for the last few months, uh, flooding in Thailand, huge, terrible, epic disaster in Thailand, which you might not really be concerned about, not because you're heartless, but because Thailand's far, far away, except that Thailand is where a, the majority probably of Western digital drives are produced and, and the core of some of the basic parts like the you know, gigantic uh, magnetic uh, heads are produced. And all of a sudden around uh, the beginning of October, hard dive prices through the ceiling, parts that were a hundred bucks um, 
the month before suddenly hit 200 plus, um, you know, prices zooming up as much as 200%. And uh, Dynamite Data, which the company looks at channel monitoring, i.e. looking at the, 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 the pricing on parts, mm -hmm. uh, and you start looking at the top hard disk drive price index, top 50 SKUs or, or uh, pieces being sold in 2011. And it's kind of funny. Um, you look at the hard disk drive price index is like 0.7. And it's 515, 615, 715, 815, 915, 1015. 1015, it spikes up to one. Uh, and the, looking at the 150 gigabyte Raptor uh, as the tracking parse. And it's, it's interesting. Um, that's the pricing on Amazon in blue if you take a look at the, the, the monitor on that. And basically, the price has went up by 42% on average. Um, the low-cost leaders in the hard drive market increased their prices by 150% as of early December. That is a ridiculous price index, or excuse me, price increase. And e-commerce inventory drops 9% late October um, in less than one week, basically because everything got so expensive. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. It's almost like they basically everybody predicted this price hike, and I'm guessing what we're right. seeing in the inventory is combination of oops shipments aren't coming in anymore and all these large companies you know uh, distributors just buying up the inventory as quickly as they can right. before those hikes go up so what's interesting is though is is uh, quote look towards the end of the timelines and the gathered data both show movement in the direction of consumers interest a jump in inventory and a drop in average pricing western digital announced on november 30th that the first of its production facilities was back online we are already seeing results of course the ceo seagate is still claiming that will take more than a year for the industry to recover but it looks like supply may increase at a quicker rate than initially expected unquote um <laughs> I think the best part is the SSD price index where you look at this one little bump around the second week of October where SSD prices spiked a little bit. But generally speaking, SSD prices, solid state drives have dropped 23%. So the average price of the top 50 SKUs or pieces, basically the, the top 50 parts being sold, uh, have mm -hmm. dropped on average 23%. That to me is the best thing about this story. So SSD it's prices crazy. continue to drop. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the, little... the information, the information was really interesting. Um, just, you know, getting a bunch of raw data on this kind of stuff for the first time since the release and, uh, seeing how it all kind of tracked over time. Uh, you know, we, we complained about the price hikes on hard drives quite a bit, but based on the inventory levels, the price hikes were kind of warranted, unfortunately, right. you know, whether or not it's mongering or scare tactics, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, but, but the inventory now going back up, that's good news, right? We can only assume that these prices will come down. And hopefully uh, the Seagate CEO that said it would take well over a year is mistaken, we'll say. Let's hope that. <laughs> yeah, it's actually been an interesting week um, for, for, for hard drive and storage or for hard drive manufacturers and storage. So Tuesday this week, Seagate uh, decided to acquire the, uh, uh, basically, there's a division of Samsung that makes rotating media that makes hard drive. Seagate agreed to buy it for uh, $1.37 billion. Uh, the majority of that in cash, the rest of it in stock. Seagate, it's kind of interesting. Essentially, Samsung, Seagate get gets like a 10% stake. No, Samsung gets a 10% stake in Seagate. Um, uh, Seagate pays like seven million in cash, and uh, Seagate stays relatively independent, which was something people were were wondering how long they could do. Uh, given that Western Digital, back in November, purchased um, uh, Hitachi's Global Storage Technologies Group for like four point three billion dollars. Um, how do you think this is going to affect consumers, Ryan? Because I'm a little uptight about it. Because Samsung was certainly a competitor. Um, I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm a little. I, I really don't. I don't. I don't think it's going to affect the average buyer much. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess I was a little bit kind of confused. There was never even any discussion of right. uh, FCC type, you know, questions, but it. I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think it'll affect much in terms of of pricing. Because uh, basically now there are two major hard drive manufacturers 
And it's, it's yeah. basically Western Digital and Seagate. Western Digital was already, well, I guess Western Digital started out selling Seagate after they bought Hitachi. Um, no, Western Digital was, was Western Digital has been the biggest for a long time. Okay. Yeah, but I guess in my mind, I kind of already thought of there being two major manufacturers, Western Digital and Seagate, and Hitachi and Samsung were always kind of secondary. Now, maybe I had a skewed perspective because I was just looking at, at right. consumer drives only. Samsung um, was still selling a lot, but uh, I, I don't, in the end, I don't think it's really going to affect very much total. <laughs> wow. Then we'll skip on to the next story. Uh, Apple made a big purchase this week. Half a billion dollars for a company called Anabit, who you've probably never heard of. The Israeli technology <laughs> company. What's that? <laughs> I, I had anybody. not heard of them, actually. Uh, you know, uh, Giga Ohm's Erica Ohm explained it pretty simply. Uh, Anabit makes flash memory devices that can use uh, MLC, multi-level cell flash-based solid-state drives. Consumer devices use MLC flash because it's cheaper, but it's also generally less reliable than single-level cell flash drives. Anabit's technology makes MLC more reliable, and Apple wanted it. Um, that's a that's a, a fairly healthy. Uh, it's not a ridiculous amount of money for for Apple, but for mm -hmm. any normal company, uh, a half million or a half billion dollars would be a fair chunk of change. But it definitely means that Apple Apple is pushing to get away from rotating media as quickly as possible and go in all flash all the time. I think it's an interesting, interesting actually, step for Apple. I actually I have to believe that whatever this company is doing is magical. Because for, for a company <laughs> like Apple that doesn't, you know, doesn't go out on a tear buying companies like somebody like Google might, to, to, to spend half a billion dollars for a company that we have never heard of before, and right. the, the sole benefit is Anabit's technology makes MLC more reliable. Well, there's a lot of stuff that I know of that makes MLC more reliable. So what do they right. do that's so much better it's worth Apple just immediately buying them up. Because it sounds to me like they heard the story, they heard about the company, like, oh, man, that's perfect. We want that now, as opposed to maybe kind of evaluating options. I'm sure they did that, but, you know, we didn't hear any, like, kind of rumors about this. We didn't hear anything describing what this company did beforehand. It's not like, you know, it was big news in the industry, and then Apple bought it. It was, you know, well, it seemed, it seemed it's, sudden it's, to me. C CNET's got a pretty good article. Um, Anabit acquisition keeps Apple ahead in flash memory. Let me drop that into the uh, Google Docs. So everybody can see that one. Um, but one one of the things that, that Brooke Crothers points out in this article is that Apple's already developing flash technology uh, in-house. Um, but the reliability issue, I think, is a problem that Anabit has solved. And where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, basically, it's talking about how as, as memory gets smaller, as the cells get smaller, and they're more susceptible to electrical interference, um, what's interesting is where did it go? Where did it go? Where did it go? Uh, right. So, hey, when I like find the quote I want, then I lose it. Um, but the idea is that uh, Anabit has a, a better... Um, technology for for keeping uh, uh, NAND memory reliable because right because hey, there it is Anabit has developed a memory signal processor or MSP that is able to manage very high bit error rates and extend the life of flash memory devices. Um, the short answer is they make good stuff. <laughs> Apparently good enough that Apple wanted to control it. Much like, I mean, you know, Apple's A5 processor um, is essentially, an, you know, Apple acquired a company that, that does accelerated uh, uh, accelerated ARM processors. So Apple's pretty, pretty willing to spend money if they think it's going to give them a, a, a leadership position uh, right. in the market. But, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting looking at the, uh, the, the error correction factor that's going on this you know if you want to get you know <laughs> look for embedded computing design an article called signal processing and the evolution of nand flash memory by uh naftali somer phd if you want to get your nerd on um because <laughs> essentially they're talking about uh an msp net basically incorporating signal processor to compend to combat nand flash process and array impairments um this is some interesting stuff, and it basically means uh, they're trying to keep errors from propagating so fast your device becomes useless as the density of memory gets higher and higher and higher. Um, 
Interesting stuff. We should take a moment now to thank uh, our sponsor of This Week in Computer Hardware. This week, our lead sponsor is Ford. And we got a special treat for you. Mr. Leo Laporte himself is going to show off a little bit of sync technology. Hey, everybody. Leo Laporte. I thought we'd take a, a little ride. We've been talking about the Ford sync and my Ford Touch for so long. And I've never actually shown you how it works. You know, Ford sent down this new 2012 Ford Focus, not mine to keep, alas. But I would like to show you, as long as I've got it, a little bit about the nav and the services and the app link and all the cool things. Let's get inside and I'll give you a tour of the 2012 Ford Focus. We're going to, I just could go for a little ride. Look, see this button? Watch. I got my foot on the brake. You press the button. It's a fob. Keyless. Car starts up. Oh, here we go. I like this too when the screen comes on it says hello good morning you are arriving you're driving a Ford all right let's go here yeah this is nice this is sweet hands on the wheel eyes on the road that's the whole idea behind sync and my Ford touch but you hit this paddle right here and you can do anything so one of the nice things of course uh, about sync and my Ford touch is I can connect to a cell phone I've got my uh, iPhone hooked up here but not just as a phone, I can make calls with it, of course, but can I, I can also uh, use it as a media device. So watch, I'll play a song here. Please say a command. Audio. Audio, say a command. Play artist Steely Dan. Playing artist Steely Dan. And now without doing anything, I've picked an artist. I can do the same thing with podcasts, books on tape or audiobooks, anything that's on my devices, I can play. I can even say, let's play the radio. The idea is you can do anything you want with this. Uh, you've got a whole media hub. So if you've got a Nano, the kid's Nano, if you've got a phone via USB or Bluetooth, uh, you just talk to it and tell it what you want to hear. Let, let's give it a try here. This is while I'm driving. USB. USB. Play artist Steely Dan. Now that's cool, isn't it? It's little things like that to just make it a pleasure to drive a Ford. I love watching Leo demo stuff. He looked happy. He also plays a lot of Steely Dan. <laughs> this must be his favorite artist. It was. Speaking of favorite. I think both of us have a new favorite monitor. Neither one of us are ever going to be able to afford it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, thirty this thousand dollars. I don't like you to say it out loud to be perfectly honest with you. Thirty thousand dollars. This is a I've seen some thirty thousand dollar monitors. I want to say it's like a thirty six inch 4,000 by 2,000 display, which is a ridiculously high resolution. Um, yeah, 4096 by 2160, 36-inch monitor. This is this is this is basically a a, a high-end broadcast monitor. Thirty. You know, they, they say its primary dollars. its primary use is in the medical field and um, uh, like uh, scientific fields where you need to read diagrams that maybe you you know they've done a lot of research for oil. That kind of stuff like that. This, this, this oh, wow. and obviously for medical fields, reading CAT scans and that kind of stuff. Super high res displays. I mean, because you got to think, you know, if you have a, a monitor, say you have a 24 inch display now, it's a 1080p monitor, um, you're looking at a pixels per inch density of about 91. With this wow. display, you're going to 36 inches and 4K by 2K, and you're talking about 128 pixels per inch so it's a it's it's a very dramatic increase and you know i got to sit in front of one of these and uh play dirt 3 on it and dirt 3 was running at the 4096 by 2160 resolution and it looked really awesome yeah i mean and, and you know all the i might have been playing it on one of these cards at the time so that gives you a little bit of a of an idea right <laughs> so i guess now the the, the the reviews are up on at this resolution with 8x anti-aliasing and everything turned up to its ultra settings. I think we got about 30 frames per second on Dirt 3. So you can go back and look at our 7970 review and see how that compares. Um, but, you know, just, I mean, even like if you see the picture of the Windows screenshot showing the resolution at 4096 by 2160, it's just, right. I really want one of these. But uh, 
Not for $3,000. Unless, unless, the, unless EZO, I, we should say the name. It's the uh, EZO, EZO, EZO DuraVision EZO. FDH 3601. And if they are listeners of the show, if they would send Patrick and I one, we will gladly test it uh, thoroughly. <laughs> We're going to have to test it to you because I don't have two GPUs to power it. I love I'll the talk fact about that it's it every basically... Week. <laughs> requires a pair of dual link DVI connections or a pair of DisplayPort connections in order to have enough bandwidth for peak refresh rates. When, and when we say peak, we're talking about um, 30 frames per second. I, it's kind yes. of funny. Like, uh, it, I just keep thinking like, oh, it's the retina display for your desktop. So, yeah, I mean, if that's, you that's, that's, have that's the that's money. It, yeah. Buy one and tell us how awesome it is. And hopefully more games will recognize the 4096 by <laughs> resolution. NVIDIA driver fixes GTX 560 Ti 2 win X79 issue. Does this mean all of your motherboard, X79 motherboard pain is over or just this one particular corner of it, Ryan? Just, just, just this one particular corner of it. So I complained about this last week because I kind of went off on a little rant about <laughs> um, the problem with SLI being that they require this certification, this kind of absurd certification program and licensing fees, and this is one of the, the, the caveats right. to it is you get kind of things. Well, either either it was well-timed or they heard me complain a lot, and like literally 13 hours later, I was emailed a new driver that fixes it, which, which again tells you. It kind of still reiterates my point. Like I'm glad they fixed it because... I'm sure I'm not the only person that had this type of this type of problem, but it, it reiterates my issue of this was just a software problem. This is not a hardware configuration issue. This is simply a, uh, yeah, you know, we've got to we've got to set that to be approved because we, you know, they have to have that option in their driver <laughs> to keep things that aren't approved from from working with SLI. So um, it's it fixed now. It's fixed now. So if you have a GTX 560 Ti to win or 460 Ti to win, the card that came out last generation with the same idea, it will now work with an X79 motherboard as long as you use the 290.53 driver or later. So <laughs> thanks to them for fixing it. I wish we didn't have the issue to begin with. Gosh darn it. And I'm not even sure where to go with just because you gave your GPU new clothes doesn't mean we won't notice it's the same inside, which is, of course, about rebranding and rebadging, i.e. taking a irritating part. Actually, it's an irritating process. It could be a great part. Um, but uh, rebranding and rebadging is becoming a very bad habit for both major GPU manufacturers. So... Yeah, <laughs> you're not a big fan of the the GTX 780, are you? <laughs> no. So that the the title of that news story is more about the Mobility 7000 series stuff. It's kind of a secondary mm -hmm. part to the post. The 780 leak, if it's true, right. it's kind of awesome. So we just talked okay. about the 7970, and it kind of makes sense if you're Nvidia's PR marketing machine. You don't want people really excited about the 7970. You want people thinking about your future product. So a slide leaks out uh, with a picture of Kepler, the, the person, not the GPU, on it. <laughs> and it talks about a GTX 580 and a GTX 780, which in itself is interesting, meaning there's going to skip the 600 branding and go straight to the 700 branding because obviously a 7000 part is better than a 600 part. Now you've got at least matching first digits. Um, if the graphs are accurate in any kind of shape or form, it looks like the 780 would be more than 2.2 times as fast as the 580 in games like Crisis 2, Metro 2033, um, Battlefield 3 is more than two times as fast. That's a That's huge a jump. jump. Yeah, so we're talking about 20% gains in uh, going from the, the, from the 580 to the 7970. If they're seeing 100% gains going from the 580 to the 780, AMD single GPU might be in trouble again. And, and if that does turn out to be the case, I have no idea. I, I have no knowledge about whatever NVIDIA's next generation parts are yet. If it does turn out to be the case, it kind of falls in line with what happened last generation. Remember, the GTX 580 was significantly right. faster than the 6970, which was their single GPU part. But AMD released the 6990, which was their dual GPU part which then they went on to claim was the, 
the fastest graphics card on the planet, and this was their plan all along type of thing, was to have two smaller GPUs running together to create the best graphics card, whereas NVIDIA always had the larger single GPU fastest part. So it kind of fits in line with the two design goals from, from either team. We'll just have to see uh, if it actually comes to pass and when it will come to pass if, right. uh, you know, if you sell, if everybody buys an AMD card between now and March, nobody's going to want a, a 780 no matter how good it is. So <laughs> keep that in mind, AMD. Ship quickly, ship fast, ship in volume. Should we even yeah. talk about some of the naming issues that are coming up with, with sort of rebranding older cards? Or is it just check the benchmarks before you buy something? It's, it's almost all on the mobile side. It's almost all on the mobile side that that's okay. happening. Um, so okay. it's still a pain in the butt. It's still stupid. I still hate it. <laughs> uh, but it's not really, it's really, it's honestly not even the GPU guy's fault, which is what is so, so annoying about it, right? So basically, if you're, right. if, if Dell comes to you and says, hey, we're going to sell Ivy Bridge notebooks, um, but we don't want to, we don't want to brand them as having the same graphics performance as they had before. So if you could just change the name of that 550 to 650, you know, we'll buy $300 million worth of parts. If you're NVIDIA or AMD, you go, Yes, sir. It's we've launched a 650 now, right? <laughs> and and that's basically what happens is that Brr. these vendors want that to happen because Nvidia doesn't sell to consumers. All right. all rebranding does is piss consumers off. So right. they're more appeasing the 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 OEMs. There you have it. Speaking of OEMs, uh, not that this is a particularly elegant transition or segue, but CES. Fast coming. Uh, it's oh, like 22 so days to CES, give or take, uh, depending on how good my math is. Um, and it was an interesting, um, um, you know, interesting uh, uh, announcement. Um, CES, or I should say CES, obviously, the, the Consumer Electronics Show, the biggest event in the consumer electronics industry, which is, you know, Intel is going to be there, NVIDIA is there, in, in, Microsoft's done the keynote for the past few years, and Microsoft's official statement, um, basically, Microsoft's walk, it, 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 I'm trying to put this into context, Microsoft has one of the biggest, if not the biggest booths at CES, and Microsoft has, has said, after thinking about questions like these, we've decided this coming January will be our last keynote presentation and booth at CES. We'll continue to participate in CES as a great place to connect with partners and customers across the PC, phone, and entertainment industries. But we won't have a keynote or booth after this year because our product news milestones generally don't align with the show's January timing. And it's kind of funny because in some ways this reminds me a lot of, of Apple walking away from Macworld, uh, mm -hmm. basically saying that, you know, we're tired of having to have something cool to announce at Macworld. Screw it. We're not going to be a part of Macworld anymore, which kind of gutted Macworld in some ways, didn't gut it in others. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly not going to be gutted by, by Microsoft walking away. But I'm trying to, trying to decide what exactly this says. Um, you know, and don't get me wrong, like Microsoft's booth is big and it's well located, but I'd say Samsung's booth is at least as big and several other booths are probably at least as big. I'm, I, what do you think? Do you care that, that I mean, the original Xbox I, was announced at CES. Um, Project Natal, uh, mm -hmm. which became the Kinect, was kind of like semi-released or at least the, the in theory was kind of partially announced at CES. Um, right. Yeah. I, as, as a hardware guy, I don't particularly care. Um, like right. I, I've never, I've never gone to visit the Microsoft booth at CES. I've never gone to the keynote right. at CES because we're kind of more focused than than what Microsoft tends to cover. However, right. I will say that I, I do kind of worry that this could be that first domino um, uh -huh. that will kind of spell the deterioration of CES. I don't think it'll ever just go away like Comdex did, but it will slowly deteriorate. Right. You know, I, I, what I'll see is Microsoft will have their own press event some other time of the year on a regular basis type of thing. I mean, they said in the press release that they were going to focus on social networking to make their announcements. And I immediately, like, groaned and rolled my eyes. I was like, this is just fantastic. <laughs> um, because I, I do think there are benefits to having these large conventions where right. you and I and everybody else kind of in the media show up to learn all this new stuff all at one time. 
Um, but as you see, as we see with CES, it, which is why CES starts on a what Wednesday? Is that right? Wednesday, Thursday, right. or Tuesday, Wednesday, well, Thursday, Friday? I mean, there's the. Well, the, that's what I'm saying. The, it starts on Tuesday. <laughs> I'm showing up on Saturday because right. We want to set up and get ready for the days full of stuff that starts on Sunday. So it's. It's been getting earlier. People want to separate themselves from the noise of CES. This is why the 7970 right. launch happened on the 22nd as opposed to on January 9th, which was the original release date. They, they knew that they released a GPU at CES. Nobody's going to notice because there's going to be 100,000 press releases sent out that week. Um, right. Now you have the 100,000. Right. Well, <laughs> maybe I'm exaggerating some, but it's like they were kind of stuck in that spot. Well, do we release during the Christmas, New Year's time frame and get lost in that noise? Do we, do we announce during CES and get lost in that noise? They don't want to wait till after CES and give their competition right. any kind of window uh, of time frame. So, Especially I think with you something see like more the more 780. <laughs> right, with the, the 780. 780. They, saw, <laughs> they must have saw that leaked graph, right? So it, it's, it's one of those things where I think Microsoft leaving is a bigger deal than obviously CEA is going to make it out to be. And that Microsoft, right. simply because they don't want to be, they don't want to be that company that says, "Man, CES is a bunch of crap. We're out of here." You know, they're going to be well political about it and 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 say, "You know, this is we just had a difference of opinion. We didn't. We we're going to go through different avenues." But I think it's more worrisome for CES than uh, maybe a lot of people think. You could also argue that that Microsoft never had the traction at CES that they wanted. I mean, Connect Runaway hit, um, sure, but. Outside of the Connect, I mean, a, a lot of the Windows, you know, Windows Media Extenders never took off. I think the way um, Microsoft wanted them to, um, Windows, uh, uh, you know, Windows Media Center probably never really took off in the, in the home theater market the way Windows wanted it to. Um, Windows mobile devices have been uh, just a mess. Uh, although I will say, you know, Windows Phone Seven, good looking operating system, has a lot of potential. Partnership with Nokia. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting to see whether or not, you, you know, I, I think Microsoft's saying is, you know, we don't need this to be a player slash this huge presence we pushed so hard on is maybe not giving them the advantages they wanted or, or had hoped for at a CES. But yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see whether or not CES finally starts to tip a little bit down. Um, there, there are already several hardware specific companies that I know of that have been in to every CES I've ever been to. Right. That are like, right. you know, we're going to send a couple of reps there. They're kind of going to wander around and talk to people. We're not getting booth space. We're not going to rent a suite. Right. So I kind of already get that feeling. And it's, on one right. hand, I'm like, sweet. I don't have to go see yes anymore. <laughs> on the other hand, I'm like, uh, you know, it's it's good. I think it's a good experience for... I think it's also, it, it's hard to be a PC hardware manufacturer and feel like you can make anything that resembles a dent at CES. Well, you, cause to, you know, and, and we'll have pictures... Well, yeah, well, it, you know, the, just you take a picture of the Samsung booth at CES last year. It's one of the most amazing things right. I've ever seen. A ridiculous over the top. It was like some freaking twisted nightclub designer with an unlimited budget and, you know, <laughs> just started molding fiberglass and trying to figure out, like, how pimp can we? I, okay, I've got 300, <laughs> I've got 300, you know, I've got 355 inch monitors, a giant framework to hang them from that's like 50 feet high, and I'm going to do a light show in the middle of it. And that's, it's not even beginning to describe how over the top Samsung's booth was. So, over the top so entertainment, we, so got over the top. <laughs> yeah. We also have Netflix to look forward to, one of the other sponsors, <laughs> our, our second sponsor of this week in computer hardware. That's right. This episode is brought to you by Netflix, our longtime sponsor. We love them. Uh, we know you guys love them too. But if you are one of the few people that haven't given Netflix a try, um, you just need to pay attention to us, I guess. They, you know, the Netflix streaming service allows you to get thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, saving you time, money, and hassle. You don't have to worry about stopping at the grocery store to pick up something or drop something off or anything like that. You know, no, no, no DVDs, nothing, nothing physical to deal with, which is always really nice. Um, the best part about it is it, it's accessible in so many different ways. If you have a gaming console like a Xbox 360 or a PS3 or a Wii, you can access it through that. Uh, of course, obviously, your PC, your Mac, your iPad, the iPhone, more and more Android phones support the Netflix streaming capability as well, which is nice. If you don't have any of those, if you have, you know, you can hook it up to your TV through an Apple TV or Roku box, DVD players, TVs, all kinds of different 
hardware supports Netflix. You might not even know this. Maybe your TV already supports Netflix, and you don't even know it yet. So it's something definitely worth uh, looking up. With Netflix, you can watch those movies uh, as many times as you want, no matter where you're at. Also, it has the, this cool feature that's basically kind of like a, a mobile DVR. If you start watching a program in one location, you can finish it in a completely other location. So if, you, if you're watching it downstairs, you can finish it upstairs. Or if you're watching it downstairs, you can finish it you know, on the cab ride to your hotel when you land in New York City, for example, right? As long as you have access to, to an internet connection and your phone or your tablet, you can do streaming Netflix. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies as many times as you want. Great for kids for that exact reason. And you can cancel at any time if you're not happy with the service. Uh, but even better than that, we're going to give you 30 days free to try out the service and figure out which ways you're going to like it. Netflix.com slash twit <laughs> is the URL for that. If you sign up there, helps us, helps you guys. Netflix.com slash twit. Get your 30 days absolutely free. We thank Netflix for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware, and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. There you have it, people. So, so I think we have time for some emails. I don't know. At this point, it's like, we, for those of you who, who were not listening to This Week in Computer Hardware Live, we had some spectacular technical difficulties, um, all of which have been solved, or at least we hope they have if you're actually watching this. Yeah, um, yeah. We'll so later. at this point, I have no idea how long the show is. So if it's been a little long. Um, I, think, I, think we're, I think we're good. <laughs> I think we've got about, we're, we're about 15 minutes from our regular show time. So we'll, we'll be able to get through a handful. Well, do you want to talk about Steve's got a question? Interesting. Steve has a memory problem. He found it with Memtest 86, fantastic free program for testing memory. He basically created ISO boot disk, run it, and it will test your memory seven ways from Sunday. And basically, the short answer is if it starts spitting out error numbers, you have a problem. And if it doesn't, Memtest 86 uh, basically just keeps churning. Um, of course, our DDR2, 6400, two gigabyte DIMMs, uh, one of a matched pair, and that's where it gets interesting. Um, because he was pleasantly surprised that the Corsair memory has a lifetime memory. Uh, the Corsair's warranty service suggests that in the case of matched pairs that he return both modules, so the replacement is also a matched pair. He thinks this is nice, but this will render him without his gaming rig for the two weeks it takes for the new DIMMs to get here. He says, uh, Steve says, I'm getting by okay on just two gigs. It's an XP box that I keep lean. His question, since this is a currently shipping Corsair product, if they send me the same SKU for a replacement, won't the replacement DIM be a decent match for what I have now anyway? How much would I gain by getting a, quote, factory matched, unquote, pair? Thanks, and keep up the great podcast, Steve. Does, does factory matched have any real-world meaning? So it used to. That's, this, this is why uh -huh. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around it, because... right. When, 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 when dual channel memory first was kind of coming out, it was, it was important to get matched memory um, for stability and performance purposes. Um, mm -hmm. As things have gotten progress, as things, as things progressed, it became less and less important. I, I have no qualms now putting in, you know, two different mismatched four gigabyte DIMMs into right. uh, a Sandy Bridge platform or something like that. Now, so he's, he's using a, does he say what CPU? He is using, he does not say, does he? No. So it's DDR2, so it's a little bit older that way. Um, I, I don't think it'll be a problem, to be honest with you. I think where his problem might show up is if he says to Corsair, I only want to send you one DIM back, they may right. say, we have to have both DIM backs in order, to, in order to honor the warranty. Because then if they, you know, they're going to be ultra cautious and if they send you one DIM, they don't want that to turn into a problem down the road and then have this customer say, hey, you know, when we did this, I only got one new DIM from you. And they're like, uh, this is why we do that in pairs. So, I know, I understand his problem. Nobody wants to be without their gaming rig for a week or two. Um, you may, maybe, maybe you call them back and you beg for uh, the dropship thing where you give them your credit card to put a hold on it. They ship you the memory first and you ship the old right. memory back that way that's if they offer that i don't know if they do but if they offer that you know you could kind of ask for that um and then if you really want to then yeah, i think you should be fine with non-perfectly matched dims ddr2 yeah. 800 or ddr2 6400 yeah 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 that's i i think you'll be <laughs> I think you'll be fine 
Uh, we got or an email from really... John. What's that? Go ahead. No, no, no. It's okay. <laughs> oh, email from John about uh, trying to use an MSATA, MicroSATA SSD. He says he recently picked up a ThinkPad X120E, and I noticed that my friend who has the same laptop with a Corsair SSD has extremely uh, fast load times. Unfortunately, I'm a sucker for having more hard drive space on the go, but notice that the laptop has an empty MSATA port on the inside. And I found a hmm. Kingston SSD, uh, the SSD now MS100, for under 100 bucks. Is it worth it to have dual hard drives on my laptop and get some of the benefits of an SSD, or will the Kingston SSD not be big enough of an improvement over standard drive? Uh, and should I just go with the Corsair and live with the fewer gigabytes? This is my first time jumping into the SSD world, and I'm not sure the MSATA Kingston is worth it. Hmm. Uh, I think moving to a, a SATA drive is always, almost always worth it. Um, right. If you're, so the only, the only issue you're going to have is if you have two drives, right? You're gonna, if you have an MSATA 64 gig SSD for 100 bucks, less than 100 bucks, and then you have your existing, let's say, 300 gig or 250 gig hard drive, the only problem you're going to have is you're going to have two drive letters that you're going to have to deal with organizing your data, right? So if you mm -hmm. want to install games, maybe you install the one or two you're currently playing on C, and then you move the other ones over to D when you need to, or your music collection can obviously go on D, and your video collection can go on D, and just keep your apps on, on the SSD. That's the only issue I see with it. Other, I mean, and that's something that as a desktop user, we deal with all of the time. Uh, right. I, I think there are very few SSD users that have only an SSD, especially on the desktop. <laughs> so, I know even on a notebook, it's not so bad. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. My, the notebook I'm using now is indeed just a single 160 gig drive, but I don't, it's not my every, it's not my all day, every day computer. So I don't store my music and my right. videos and that kind of stuff on it. I kind of copy things to it when I need it and delete it when I don't, knowing that it's not my primary system. So if he's, <laughs> it sounds like he uses this more as his primary rig uh, and yeah. the extra space would be kind of beneficial. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's kind of funny. It's, I, I, you know, like if you can go from rotating media to, to SATA, please do it because just the resume from freaking suspend will blow your mind. <laughs> yes. It's just, or the resume from, since you're running a ThinkPad, the resume from Hibernate will be like, it's, yep. it's just get it. That's what I have. Yep. Chase, Chase has an email. Well, Chase is looking to fix his, his Battlefield 3 bottleneck. He says, okay, guys. I wrote it a few weeks ago that a, about a Battlefield 3 bottleneck running on Ultra with 4X anti-aliasing and only getting 55 frames per second in 3x24 by 5560 by 1080 resolution, i.e. three monitors, and I found a fix. I took the overclock down to 4 gigahertz from 4.5 and lowered the CPU voltage to 1.44 and added another HD 6990 rather than the 6970, and I am experiencing over 80 frames per second all times now. Couldn't be happier. Bulldozer's working out just fine with four GPUs. Do you guys have a look at my 30 terabyte home Windows server yet? Is Patrick impressed? I am impressed, sir. I have not <laughs> seen it yet. But just hearing about 30 terabytes with a single home server has me impressed. I have a mere 12 terabytes. So I am jealous yeah. of your 30 terabyte Windows home server. I'm also giggling. It's like, you know, um, I found a fix, <laughs> which is like, you know, dropping the overclocking and adding a fourth GPU. <laughs> so I don't, I guess, I don't understand why he would downclock uh, the process. Maybe he couldn't get the fourth GPU to run unless the overclocking was, was dropped down a little bit. I guess um, that's the only thing I can think of, unless he was just trying to lower temperatures or something like that. Um, yeah, because I mean, so his solution was <laughs> adding another dual GPU graphics card. Uh, that's like, that's brute force reaction to, <laughs> to frame rate deficits right there. So, you know, I was, kudos to him for that. Nothing wrong with um, a little brute force. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> so this, this was an interesting email from John. He has this mm -hmm. kind of theory about making AMD exciting again in the CPU space, which after the bulldozer launched, they were less than exciting, I guess. Uh, bulldozer performance is a disappointment, hardly outperforming Phenom 2. The Phenom 2 is being discontinued. Pile driver is a long way off. Uh, I don't know how long it is away, John, but it is it is in the distance. And by the time it arrives, Intel will even be further ahead. What can AMD AMD do relatively quickly to win back customers and have something to shout about? Uh, and then he proposes this idea. 
Uh, migrate the Phenom 2 Thuban core design from 45 to 32 nanometer process. This will allow 12 cores on a single die. Single, single core performance would still be behind Sandy Bridge, but head of Bulldozer. Uh, but single core performance doesn't seem to be the bottleneck for games anyway. Advantages, relatively quick and cheap to implement. Cheap AM3 Plus motherboards, perfect for low-cost desktops. Uh, what do you think? Is this feasible? Mm. Um, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, the reason I kind of put this in there is not to just kind of shove the idea off, but I'm sure there are a lot of other people that think this. Why doesn't AMD just take that Phenom 2 X6 core that turns out to be a little, maybe a little bit better than Bulldozer in, in many, many cases right. and just kind of keep using it? Well, the thing is, is he, he says some things like uh, convert it from 45 to 32 nanometers. And it's, it's so much more complicated than that. Uh, you know, the, the design <laughs> time, it's not, it's, yeah. not simply, it's not simply here's the 45 nanometer production box and import design document. Okay, print at 32 nanometer. It's, I mean, it's, it is a huge job to do that. Right. Even if you did, he says it'll allow 12 cores on a single die, twice that of a Phenom X6. That depends on what the design uh, implementations of the Phenom core actually are. Does the crossbar that permits the communication between all the cores on the Phenom die have enough bandwidth to handle more than six cores? Can it do just eight? Yeah. You know, those just of, just those because, all kinds just of things. Those because just because you can measure the cores and in theory those cores will fit. Uh, on on the new die size that you've created yeah. by magically converting uh, a 45 nanometer part to 32 nanometers doesn't mean they can actually physically run that there won't be so much crosstalk between the cores. Um, you know, Ryan's pointing out like you know, can you actually get them? You know, can, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's it would if if you could magically hit the print button and print it out at 32 nanometer, freaking win. 12 cores, we're all happy. Um, if, you know. if it were that easy, we'd have a hundred different designs on the market today from Intel and right. AMD best, but it takes years of design and, and, and manipulation to get these things produced in a way. So the advantages, it really comes down to, he thinks one of the advantages <laughs> would be relatively quick and cheap to implement. And that's just not the case. AMD made a decision five years ago that the bulldozer architecture was going to be what was going to take them into the future. Now, right. if you're a really big company like AM, or Intel, maybe you have two of those going at the same time and then at the last minute you get to pick which one you think is the best. And by last minute, I mean two years out instead of five years out. AMD doesn't really have that capability because they're a smaller, much less profitable company. So they make, they place their bets way in the past and they, they have to reap what they sow in that, in that regard. So it's, it's not as simple as going back and doing that. Could they maybe have kept producing the Phenom 2X6s for a little bit to keep some of the enthusiasts around? Maybe, but right. it's too late for all that. So <laughs> They've made their bed, and now they're going to lie in it. And yes. as, you know, as I was talking to Lloyd Case about it, you know, it's, it, Bulldozer's not a bad part if you need lots and lots of cores. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's just in terms of raw performance, single core stuff, not as impressive as people would have liked. If you've got an application where you can throw all those cores at it, um, it's got more potential. David's got a question. He's got, uh, he's looking for crazy cooling ideas. He says, hey guys, love the show. Wondering if it's possible to keep my computer cool without fans or liquid cooling. I find that my current fans are pretty loud and it's driving me nuts. Since this machine will be replaced within 12 to 24 months, I don't really want to sink any more cash into it. All crazy ideas will be accepted. <laughs> he's got a Radeon HD 4870, uh, Phenom 2, Antec EA650, uh, power supply, an Asus motherboard, uh, M4A77 TD Pro motherboard, a Cooler Master Mystique, body, 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 black aluminum SCCC ATX mid tower computer case. Um, yep. You know, Arctic, uh, uh, the Arctic cooling folks have, let me pull up the name of it because the name will never stick with me because it's way too simple. Um, there are 4870 is not a particularly huge challenge for a fanless cooler. Um, the big thing is about airflow through your case. You know, mm -hmm. I'd probably, you know, a, a large, single, well-routed 120 millimeter fan on the back of the case uh, combined, uh, you know, should pull enough air through to keep everything cool. Um, 
Phenom 2, I'm trying to think of a good, you know, you don't need silent, but anything it claims to be around 20 dB is going to be effectively silent in a typical home uh, environment. Like the only time you're going to hear something like that is four in the morning if you're afraid of waking up your spouse. Um, but yeah, you know, $100 in parts to upgrade the, the Accelero, that's the one I was trying to remember, the Accelero yep. S1 Rev Thanks. 2, um, which looks like a freaking hood. Uh, it, it looks like the grill off of like a 53 Ford. It's a gigantic um, part that goes on the side of your, of your uh, yeah. GPU. You definitely need to check your case spacing before you buy something like that because I mean, yeah. that's going to extend pretty far outside the, the bounds of the graphics card. Same thing for if you're running a, a, a stock AMD cooler um, on that uh, Phenom 2, uh, again, you're going to have to make sure you have enough space inside the case to fit one of those gigantic um, coolers. Because basically the, 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 the fans, you, you may not need all your fans. Like I can, I've got a gaming rig uh, down here. And there's like a freaking, yeah, that's, uh, it's a little dark in here. It's and dark, the yeah. The video's a little pixelated. Sorry about that. Um, there's, you know, there's a gigantic like 300 millimeter fan in the top. Don't need it. Um, there's a 120 millimeter fan uh, that spins at a higher rev, rev than it needed. So I basically converted it to, to, to run at a lower voltage. Um, you know, if you've got good airflow in your case, you know, you can probably start turning off fans. I mean, that's the first thing I do is start turning off fans and see how many fans you can turn off without your CPU temperature at idle going up and then see whether or not as you run something particularly, you know, one of your favorite applications or, or start running something that hammers on your your uh, uh, your CPU and see whether or not it can it's holding the same thermals. But yeah, you can do a lot of stuff to silence your PC. Sometimes just swapping out your existing fans for a higher quality fan, a good ball bearing fan can make a huge difference uh, in how loud your system sounds when it's running. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, start to, uh, you know, my favorite thing to do is still like, what's the loudest thing in the case? Freaking hold the fan with your finger and then figure out what the next loudest thing in the case is. And don't do this for too long because, you know, you stop the fans for a while. You stop the airflow and things heat up. But boy, mm -hmm. one by one by one, you can figure out what the three or four loudest things in the case are and start eliminating them. So we, uh, we were going to do a couple more questions. We're going to hold off those until the new year. Um, Indeed. Because it is getting incredibly late for Mr. Shrout and bordering <laughs> on incredibly late for me. Uh, so we want to thank everybody, actually, for listening to Twitch this week in computer hardware this year. Um, yeah. It is fun for yeah, us. I guess we hope it's... This, this is the last episode of the year. That's right. We are off. We won't be recording yeah. an episode on the 29th. Um, nope. So you will have to wait until... We'll do one more before our CES episode, I guess. True. Uh, as well. So uh, still send in your emails for that, twitch at <laughs> twitch.tv, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. Yeah, yeah it's, I, again, I said this before we started recording the show, had I realized earlier in the day that this was episode 150, <laughs> I might have planned something more exciting than a lot of graphics card discussion, um, but I did not. <laughs> Obviously, the well, I, I think the industry stepped up and delivered some GPU news for us. So, <laughs> so actually, you know, PCPro.com is where you can find Ryan Shrouds work regularly. Techzilla.com is where you can find my stuff. And and hey, let's say Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's to everybody. I'm Patrick Indeed. Norton. I'm Ryan Shroud. We'll see you next week. Well, the week after next week on Twitch. <laughs>